Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm back <laughs> and Gertie <laughs> has gone away now. Um, just so you know, um, there, we have a few rules. Uh, before I get to that, I'll introduce myself again. My name is Dutch Reuter. Um, I'm the communi Communications and Development Assistant here at the Library Society. Um, and like I said, we're very, very excited that you're joining us here today. Um, joining the Library Society, joining Evening Post Books, joining Buxton Books, and joining the Post and Courier. Um, and so we're very, very excited to be hosting Catherine today um, and getting to hear the story from some incredible women and have a great conversation. Um, so before I pass it over to Michael, who will introduce our speakers today, um, I just want to give you a heads up that you are muted currently and you'll stay muted throughout the um, entirety of the event. Um, towards the end of the event, we will be having a Q&A portion. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask um, Catherine or Polly towards the end, um, feel free to chat me. Um, if you, over the bottom of your screen, there is that chat, um, you are able to message me your question, and towards the end, I'll be able to answer, ask those on your behalf. Um, as always, we don't have a, all the time in the world, so um, hopefully we'll get to your question, but um, sometimes time is limited, so don't feel bad if we don't get to it. Just It just means you have to come next time um, and <laughs> ask again. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Michael Nolan, um, and he'll do our introductions. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Michael Nolan. I'm the executive editor of Evening Post Books, which is an imprint of the Charleston Post and Courier. Uh, Evening Post Books is 12 years old and has probably published around 50 titles, but one of the best ones that we have published is Gertie, The Fabulous Life of Gertrude Sanford Lejeune, Heiress, Explorer, Socialite, and Spy by Catherine Smith, also uh, author also of a book called The Gatekeeper and some other ones that she'll probably mention to you. One of the best things about Gertie is that Catherine does in extensive research. She even traveled to Europe to visit some of the spots that Gertie had frequented so she could be more knowledgeable about them. And that knowledge comes across in this book. So much so that just last month, the book won the Independent Book Publishers Association Gold Award for Biography. Uh, and this is a really big deal, including this beautiful class trophy that came with it. And I want to also mention the book's editor, John Burbage, who was one of the co-founders of Evening Post Books, and its designer, Gil Gary who is part of the, both of them are part of the reason why this is an award-winning book. Um, Polly Buxton of Buxton Books here on King Street is going to interview Catherine, and I will now turn it over to Polly. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Evening Post Books, and thank you, Dutch and the Library Society. Um, it is an honor to be with y'all, I am at, uh, at Buxton Books at 160 King Street. I see lots of our friends and supporters in the audience. I thank you all for being there and for your support um, on, in virtual events and when we get to see you and, and gather in person. So we're just thrilled to be here. And thank you, Michael, and thank you, Dutch. Um, hi, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm thrilled. I, you look beautiful in the in the beautiful Shakespeare room at the Library Society. It's a perfect it's a perfect backdrop. Uh, the, great the, company the, here. I have these really good looking men and roughs and just looking at me and Sir Walter Raleigh and I'm just I'm just overwhelmed. It's really a neat place. <laughs> well, it's exciting. We're glad to to have you here, and uh, we're looking forward to this conversation in this um, interesting new world that we're living in. Uh, we were, um, Catherine and I were talking earlier um, today about how this all seems so overwhelming, this new world that we're living in, and everything is so different and, and changing all the time, and we're finding ourselves talking about how difficult things are, but, um, and exciting in, in, in some ways. Uh, 
but nothing as exciting as Gertie's Life, and <laughs> a book that I got to reread uh, this week in preparation for this conversation. And it is a good reminder of um, that we have it we have it pretty good right now, don't we? <laughs> it's like we have a we have a lot of wonderful things, including books to read. Um, thank you, Catherine, for writing this book. It is it is a pleasure to read. I um, like many of the people in the audience uh, know a little bit about Gertrude Legendre and Gertie because she is not just an international and a national figure. Um, the story, she is a Charleston figure and a, a South, this is a South Carolina story. And I was wondering if we could just start there with her connection to South Carolina and Charleston. Yeah, well, Gertie's family was from New York State. Her father was a carpet manufacturer, very, very wealthy, what you think of as a robber baron. And she just happened to be born in Aiken in 1902 because her family had horses and they came to Aiken for the winters. Her father had been coming to Aiken for years before he married. He was actually rather old, you know, in his 40s when he married. And she's the youngest of three children, born in Aiken in 1902 in um, March, which is sort of the end of the horse season, which I think it was almost an accident that she was born in Aiken. But the family um, came back to Aiken for winters um, for years, and she spent a lot of time in South Carolina as a child. Um, they came to Charleston and, and you know, did a lot of vacationing where rich people hung out together. So, um, I think that she had a real fondness in, in her heart for South Carolina and the Low Country, and it was when she was married and on her honeymoon that she came to Charleston and found her future home. And that's this is where you know Gertie was someone who's um, had itchy feet. She never stayed put in one place for long, but the place she always came back to was Medway in Berkeley County, which was her home. Well, thank you, and that is. Um... Medway is a very special place. I'm going to hope that we will talk about that a little bit later because that is a powerful part of her story and her legacy. Uh, but back oh, to, uh, go ahead. We've got, to, we've got to show the baby picture. Oh, the baby picture. Of her baby, where she was really uh, this home. is dirty as a precious. baby. <laughs> precious. She was serious from the beginning, wasn't she? <laughs> she was mischievous. Look at that face. And, you know, I just can't, I can never get over it. When you look at someone, an adult, and see their baby picture, you can see what their face is going to look like in that baby. And uh, I just think this is such a cute picture. But, yeah, that was dirty as a baby. <laughs> pretty, pretty precious. She looks determined. I agree. <laughs> We know a little bit about those preco precocious, determined children in Charleston. Yeah. Um, yeah she, I can see why she was right at home with that. <laughs> um, her connection to Charleston also, she left um, copious journals and diaries. And, and wow. so when you're, she left these to the College of Charleston, correct? Her family gave them to the College of Charleston's Alston Library after she died. I'm not sure if that was her directive, but it was a great place for them to go. And she was very aware of her um, importance and value, I guess, as an observer of the scene all through the 20th century. Because she lived from 1902 to 2000, and almost anything that happened in the 20th century, Gertie seemed to have been a part of. So it's a, it's a wonderful archive. A lot of it is digitized which meant that um, even though I spent many, many hours in Charleston at the library doing research, I could go home to Anderson, where I live, and read, it, read letters and diaries and scrapbooks and uh, look at pictures from the comfort of my own computer. So it's, it's a really wonderful archive. And um, she had, if I had looked at every piece of paper and every picture of that, I would still be there. It's, it's huge. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm a little jealous of your, uh, that you were able to do that. It just sounds extraordinary to get to read her journals and to, yeah. are those available to the public if people? Oh yeah, people I think anyone, to? anyone, that's the marvelous thing. Whenever I was in the library and the staff there is just, is so helpful. People would just come in and say, you know, I'm researching my ancestors or I'm trying to find out about a cemetery and they're just, it's, there are lots of great resources for that, and they're happy to help anyone, whether they're a professional researcher or a faculty member or just somebody comes in, you know, from one of the county somewhere and needs some help. Well, to start at the beginning, uh, we were with that precious baby picture and her diaries, but when did she start journaling on a regular basis? Did her journals go back to her childhood? 
a good question. I did not see any that went that far back. Um, I think it was when she really started traveling that she, she kept journals. And um, I don't believe she kept a daily journal, but she kept travel journals. Um, now, her husband, Sidney, kept what he called the plantation diary. So he was much more of a regular diarist. But um, yeah, and she had a very good way with words. Her, her writing is very clear. It's, um, she's got a great um, descript descriptive style, a um, terrible speller, <laughs> which she knew. <laughs> Um, she so, didn't have the uh, privilege of spell check that we yeah. <laughs> have now. I blame computers for my misspellings. They seem to not like the words that I choose and, <laughs> and autocorrect in the wrong way. Um, tell us a little bit about, because you said that she didn't have these diaries, but she was from a very prominent and well-known family and uh, whose lives were more documented um, than most would have been. And so can you tell us a little bit about her childhood? Yeah, um, her father, I guess it was her, her great grandfather had started Sanford um, Carpet Company, which became Sanford and Sons. Um, and they <laughs> continued making carpets from, they made um, blankets for the Union Army during the Civil War. And um, they had become a, a tremendous carpet manufacturer by the turn of the century and when her grandfather died her father was the sole inheritor and he inherited um, 40 million dollars which is you multiply that times 17 and that's what we're talking about today they were just filthy filthy rich <laughs> and um, along with it they had you know lots of leisure so her father's main interest was horses he had a, a breeding stable stud farm um, race race horses his, her brother was a champion polo player um, from most of, you know, into his 50s. He was, um, he was just one of the top polo players. And Gertie spent a lot of time around horses when she learned to ride in Aiken. And, and she continued to ride um, into her, I think, into her 80s at Medway. Though she admitted that she had to have a block to climb up on the horse toward the, the, those later years. And um, they were the type of people that would spend their summers in Bar Harbor or Newport and their, they'd go to Sarasota for the racing season and then they would go home to their mansion off near Park Avenue, um, off near um, Central Park for a few months. And this was a 28 room mansion, um, nice little place. It belongs to the Emir of Qatar today. And, um, and then they would go to Aiken in the winter or they'd go to Europe and they just they just spent a lot of time going places and when they went they would bring their own Rolls Royces with them and their servants and their butlers and all that so it was a very very privileged um, childhood. Yes um, so with that privilege she she really didn't have to do anything so I think this is what captivated me in the story the way that you um, so skillfully wove her her right her character that you you were able to show us the spirit of adventure that was really that you can see in that baby but mm -hmm. that, that showed itself through her choices because she really didn't need to do much right. um, but enjoy all the yeah the lifestyle that she, had. That she was sent to finishing school but Foxcroft mm -hmm. which is not a finishing school today but in the day she was one of the first students at Foxcroft in Virginia and none of the girls were really expected to do anything except marry and have children. In fact, the first graduate in each class who had four children was presented with a silver cup, which personally I think is not much of a compensation for having four children really fast. But um, only one girl in her class was planning to go on to college and Gertie said they all thought she was rather strange. But um, when she graduated, she was going to make her debut, which was expected, but she asked her father as a graduation gift to send her on a hunting trip to the Grand Tetons. And if um, we could see the picture of Gertie on her trip to Wyoming, um, he sent her along with a, a family friend, a young family friend, that's the fellow in the middle, I think, and then that's their hunting guy, George. And then the, her father's personal secretary, uh, Mr. Coffin, um, and as they're sort of her chaperone. So here she is, she's got on her chaps and a big hat and a scarf around her neck. And this is when she shot her first um, big game. It was uh, on elk. Oh. And she was, um, was just 
just uh, very, very proud of herself. She brought, that was her first trophy head, and it, today it belongs to one of her grandchildren. But she just loved the whole outdoors. She loved sleeping under the stars. She loved sitting around the campfire. Um, and she was a very good shot and a very good hunter. And she, that was the beginning of a, a real love of the outdoors and hunting and exploration. So in that way, she was not your typical debutante. No, I don't think she was your typical debutante. I, one of the first ways that I, um, first things I knew about her was this, um, fascinating. I knew her as an environmentalist mm -hmm. and uh, she was still alive when, when, when the Ace Basin and Medway were being protected, uh, but also that, um, that she was so involved with, with um, conservation in general, yeah. which I think is probably difficult for many people. Maybe it depends what generation you're from to understand that, um, that these were not um, opposing ideas at the time. When right. she was hunting, these ideas of conservation and, and even any feelings against big game hunting was not there, but she was a forerunner of that. She, right. she was captivated by the hunt and the outdoors, and, but also she very early on um, was bitten by the bug of conservation and, and that the hunting needed to have a purpose. Right. And I think you tell that beautifully uh, in, in the book. Exploration. Yeah. And that's why I tried to set her in her times because today people get, get really upset about someone who's gone out and shot a, a beautiful lion or a sudden she did her, her yeah. fair share. But at the time, um, there was so much game that lions were considered vermin. Um, they killed animals on farmers land, ranchers land, um, when they had a, whenever she and her, or whoever she was with went to a village, they would be asked to please come and kill a rogue elephant who had killed some people or, you know, that kind of thing. I know it's, and it's, for us, it's very, very hard to understand, but the numbers of animals then were just astronomical. She would look out across the Serengeti plain and could, could not even see the grass for all the, the, the herds that were running through it. And over the century, as those numbers fell and were overhunted, um, that's when she really had an awakening that, that behavior had to change, and she was very involved in that. Well, early on, wasn't she, um, I mean, she was very instrumental in getting specimens for the Museums of Natural History, um, the Museum of Natural History in New York City, but also some of the other museums around the around the country and world that she okay. actually, so that her hunting did have a purpose at that right. time. She went on a safari with her uh, brother, Laddie, the polo player, and a, a married couple to um, Kenya, and they just went to hunt. And then even though she enjoyed it, in the back of her mind, she said, I'd rather go as uh, leading an expedition, a scientific expedition. So, um, I, I really love that she came back from, well, let's see, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, first, she had to meet um, her husband-to-be, Sydney, and so she had this wonderful summer on the Riviera with the, the F. Scott Fitzgerald and Zelda Fitzgerald and Sarah and um, Gerald Murphy and, you know, all these characters, Harpo Marx, she drove Harpo Marx around in her car playing his harp. Um, could we have the picture of Sydney that I'm so fond of? Please? Oh, that's a great thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so wonderful. This is the man that Gertie later married, um, Sydney Lachand. He was, he and his brother Morris, who was every bit as good looking, were from New Orleans. Um, they met them in England where Morris was a Rhodes Scholar and the boys were inseparable. So Sydney went to England just to keep him company. And they, um, they all went over to the Riviera together and just had this wonderful summer. Um, one night, Morris and Sydney, uh, Morris and Gertie went water skiing in their evening clothes. It's just, just all this crazy kind of roaring 20s hijinks that you think of. And um, when Gertie met these guys, um, she kept talking about taking a scientific expedition. Um, okay, let's make Sydney go away. By the way, though, he's in the book, page 42, you need to buy a copy from Polly. Um, <laughs> um, when she got back to New York, she went over to the American Museum of Natural History to see the director and told him she wanted to go to Africa and bring back a grouping of a antelope, a rare antelope called the Nyala. 
and it was called the Queen of Sheba's Antelope. It has sort of a lyre-shaped horns. And um, she had done her homework, found out the museum didn't have a grouping that they wanted one for their hall of African mammals that they were planning. And so she just laid out the case. You know, she was familiar with, with Africa. She was a great hunter. She knew she could bring these things back. And then the director told her, well, that's fine and good, but it'll cost $30,000 just to mount the exhibit. <clears throat> and remember, we multiply that times 17. So we're talking, you know, close to half a million dollars. Um, so she wasn't too discouraged. She went home and did what every rich girl would do. She asked her daddy for the money. And Mr. Sanford listened and um, agreed to send her on this, this trip. And then she sent, um, the, the museum signed a naturalist to accompany her, and then she sent a wire to the Lejeune brothers and said, whoopee, we're all going to Africa together. And they went with her. So, um, let's see, I think we've got a picture of the, of the four of them. There they are, they, they're holding um, the Ni not heads of the Nyala they, they shot, and you can see the horns. And this grouping is still on display at the American Museum of Natural History. It's been there for a hundred years, almost. Um, it's, um, and it's in this hall. I've been to see it a couple of times and I'm just, just really amazed at how many people go through this hall. People bring in their children. It's really the, the very thing that the Papa Sanford said is he supported the idea of museums where the public could see exotic animals they'd never see because they wouldn't have the chance to go to Africa. So while I was standing there looking at all these little children were going up and their parents were posing them in front of the Nyala and shopping, you know, taking their pictures and all that. And it's in this, um, and the, there's next to it, there's an exhibit that was, was killed and paid for by George Eastman, the, the Kodak photography guy. Um, the inner, the centerpiece is the middle is this huge grouping of elephants of all ages. So, you know, while it makes us sad that these animals died, um, on the other hand, that's how we learn about them. And the, they were not just bringing home the Nyala, they were bringing home all sorts of other specimens. The man standing next to Gurney, um, the little short man, was the um, naturalist from the museum. And then next to her is Sydney, and next to him is uh, Morris. Um, they brought back hundreds of thousands of of specimens of rodents, birds, fish, small mammals, um, grasses, and the Museum of Na American Natural Mar American Museum has got 41 million specimens that scientists come in and study. So it's a study, it's a research center. It's not just a place for the public to go and gawk at these animals. So okay, we can close that down. Um, but the other thing that Gertie was doing on this trip was apparently auditioning um, what the, the Lajon brothers for husband. And they both proposed, there are all kinds of stories about that, flipping a coin and all kinds of stuff like that. But um, she ultimately decided that Sydney was the one for her. So they came back um, to New York and told her father that they were going to be married. And he said, oh, that's fine, my children. Let's go watch Laddie play polo. But uh, let's, let's have the wedding picture here, if we may. Okay, here's the wedding picture. Beautiful. And um, Gertie was just so proud to be surrounded by all these good looking people. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to interject for a second because yeah. we just talked about something so polarizing, but the, mm -hmm. the big game hunting, and right. I think really in the book, you really do explain that so well of, of her purpose behind that and the time that that was that, that was done, but also its lasting importance um, for research and for and for science. It, it is important that they were preserved, but uh, to go from the polarizing subject to the love story, because I mean, I'm just a romantic, and so I absolutely love the love story, and the love story with with Sydney is um, is quite special, and I and I know that. I would love you to talk a little bit more about that. It sounded kind of the way that you were talking about it just now, and I've heard it characterized that way, it makes it sound a bit more like it was an agreement, mm -hmm. but their, their love really, they really had they, quite they a really love were. They were madly yeah. in love with each other. Um, they got married, and so here they are with them. The, the Lejeans, they were four brothers, all of them just spectacularly good looking. Um, Laddie, uh, the, uh, uh, her brother, who's on the end, and 
really good looking guy. And so they had this really spectacular wedding um, at the Episcopal Church and then the reception at her house with the orange tree and bloom and all that. She said she could not wait to get away from that wedding and go off on her honeymoon. So she and Sydney went hunting together in Alaska and British Columbia. And she said in her memoirs that they were snowbound in a tent for days. It was glorious. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love that. And look at that dress. I'm sorry. I have to just. Yeah, handkerchief. Um, hands. Absolutely. And she, yeah. And she says the little um, hat, you know, she's wearing this little can't remember what you would call it, cap, a seat with, sort of with pearls all over it. But she said it was just the height of fashion. And as she was writing her book, she said, today it looks for all the world like a bathing cap, <laughs> which is so true. But yeah, it was a very stylish wedding. Those the bridesmaids had handkerchief and dresses and all that, so little pointed shoes. Um, She's extraordinary style. We saw that in the opening portrait. Uh, I yeah, she and her mother would go to Paris to have their clothes made by Worth and all that kind of thing. So she was quite a fashion plate. But um, as far as Sydney goes, it's, it, was, it was not just a one-sided thing. Um, I'm going to read just a paragraph from, um, the, from my book. <clears throat> um, writing to, now they got married in 1929, the month before the stock market crashed. Writing to Gertie in the mid 1930s when she had just departed for a short trip, Sydney confessed to leaving the station before the train pulled out, quote, because the tears were streaming down my face so that I was ashamed of the porter seeing me. In a follow up letter, he confessed to keeping a telegram for her from her under his pillow and wrote, it was about as good as being able to hold onto your nightgown. Oh, be still my heart. Um, and at this point, they had been married for five years and had a child. So this was not just a besotted bridegroom, but that was, and, and there were lots of examples like that about his love for, for Gertie. Um, so that said, well, she was the I, I would suggest I would suggest that people read more about that in the book. It really is my, my favorite. It was my favorite part to reread, and it restruck yeah. me again as a, as a really powerful part of her story, and knowing, and knowing that heart of her story yeah. um, makes a lot of other things in her life make sense. And I, I do, I know we're pressed for time on, in a way we, that I would love, to, I want to make sure that we get to some of the rather exciting things. And again, there's so much in this book and there's so much in her story uh, that people do need to, to get a book from, from us, if we would like that. Um, but, but would you um, tell us a little bit about, um, quickly about when Sydney left for war and then yeah. her decision to, um, to move on because I, to, to what she was going to this, do. This is all about her love for Sydney too. Um, he and his brother joined the Navy after Pearl Harbor and were sent to Pearl Harbor which was a really cool place to be after, you know, the bombing, because they just pretty much worked in an office and then went to Lou Isles and surfed the rest of the time. And they even opened a bathing suit shop together. But Gertie wanted to do something to fill the time because she was so lonely. She was living in Washington, D.C., and she went to work for the OSS, the Office of, um, oh, shoot, I forget what it's called. Um, it was, it was the spy agency, it was the intelligence agency run by a man named William J. Donovan, Wild Bill Donovan. And uh, Gertie was, in, was not a spy, she was not a field operative, she was over the cable desk, but that meant that she was privy to top secret information. She, you know, everything that came in, she was reading it and sending it to the right places. So she started out there and then um, she did everything she could to be able to join Sydney in um, Hawaii, nothing panned out. So when she got the opportunity to go to England for six months, she went with his blessing. Um, she parked her children with relatives in New Orleans, went over to London, liked it so much she stayed for six more months and she was there during the time when the B-1 rockets were raining down and you know destroyed thousands and thousands of homes and buildings in the city um, and was doing the same thing with the you know with the cable desk there. So when she um, when the when France was when Paris and most of France was liberated in August of 1944 she got the opportunity to go over to Paris and she um, took it and 
right as she, almost almost as soon as she got there, she got word from Sydney that he was finally getting four months leave, and she said, "I'm I'm going to resign. I'll come back. I figure they can do without me." But meanwhile, she had just one little adventure that she wanted to get done. So she went to the the Ritz Hotel in Paris one afternoon and ran into another OSS person, of, of somebody who'd been on desk jockey like her, but he was a naval commander. And they decided to take an old Q show and drive it to Luxembourg to try to see some action. Patton's army was headquartered near there. She knew Patton socially. So they were just going on a lark, basically. Well, they had car trouble the whole way. Um, they, their car was in the shop in Luxembourg. They were having breakfast at the hotel. We're gonna have to go back that afternoon without seeing anything exciting. And another OSS officer came up who her friend Bob knew. He was a major. He had a Jeep and a driver. And he said, oh, I can take you to Volendorf. It's, um, we captured it a few days ago, perfectly safe, but you'll be able to hear some gunfire. So they drove off together. And let me just read a little bit from the book about what happened. It was early afternoon on September 26, 1944, when Gertrude Sanford Lejean stumbled out of a bomb-damaged building in rural Germany sank into a pile of rubble and cursed her own stupidity. She was in Nazi custody in Volendorf, a village just over the Belgian border that had been in allied hands not long before. But the lines were changing so rapidly that Gertrude and three American companions had unwittingly crossed over to the enemy side that morning and were captured by German soldiers. What began a few days before in the bar of the Paris Ritz Hotel is a lighthearted road trip to get a look at Patton's Third Army in action had turned into a nightmare. Two of the men were seriously wounded. Their Jeep driver, a young army private, was bleeding profusely and appeared to be going into shock. All four of them faced uncertain futures as prisoners of war. So 42 years of age, Gertie was a POW. And if we could ask the picture of her, the sketch that was done, this was done by one of her prison guards. She was in Germany for six months um, in various um, places, some of them rather nice and some of them not so nice at all. But um, she never believed that she would not, es not escape or be traded or something, but um, it was a real trial for her, as you can imagine, and a very scary time. That's, yeah, that's quite, it's quite extraordinary. I. Um, this story, and again, I do think that people should read it because the details from this are extraordinary. I think it's amazing that they allowed her to, um, while she was incarcerated, um, she was in captivity, they allowed her to keep a diary and journal. And but it was a very sketchy journal. She had an amazing recall. And I've read, it's interesting, I read her journal and then I read, you know, right after she got out, she dictated an 11 page summary and then she'd get more and more detailed, but really the story never changed um, from time to time. But yeah, it was, it was really interesting. And, it, and to get a real feel for it, um, I traced most of her journey. I didn't do the, I didn't go all the way to Berlin like she did, but, um, and I started with my husband Leo at the Ritz bar in Paris where a martini cost 30 euros, about $35. Um, but just for the, you know, for this, you know, authenticity sake. And we went to a, a castle, a 13th century castle where she was kept in uh, solitary confinement. We found a little village where she was um, captured and there's still a pillbox there from the war. Um, and then we went to the hotel on the Rhine River where she stayed as a high level detainee with a bunch of French generals and Charles de Gaulle's sister. They were all a bunch of old crotchety generals from World War I who the Germans had scooped up for fear they'd be called back into active duty. And um, well, you know, they did such a bad job with the first war. Why would they call them for the second? I don't know. But that was, um, we stayed at the hotel where she was a prisoner and actually may have been in the same room. So um, that was, I really enjoyed getting that feel for what life was like for Gertie in, in confinement. Well, you're talking about confinement and solitary confinement at that. And um, it makes me um, think about your, you did a little series of YouTube yeah. videos that are a total <laughs> hoot. And, uh, and I encourage anyone to go and look at those because it's, it's quite fun um, 
tips for solitary confinement um, during COVID-19 and during quarantine. Um, and not to make light, that does make light of it, but it is really, but they're really wonderful tips. And I do have to, I think it's been um, quarantine and um, a lack of freedom, even though uh, it's, you cannot compare that to what uh, prisoners of war and yeah. including Gertie, who was, who was in, she had pretty good conditions. Yeah, she, she was interrogated repeatedly, yeah. but she was not right. tortured. And, you know, generally right. she was fed pretty well. I think the worst thing for her is she had to wear the same her uniform for, for six months and uh, only got to take a bath once a month. But you think she about... We really about, well hygiene. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've watched, we've watched um, what we're experiencing right now is that some people are actually quite content. Um, yeah. With uh, with a slow down lifestyle and a and a little less human contact, but mm. someone with the adventurous um, spirit that that Gertie had and she was known for and that really drove her her entire life for her to be in confinement away from Sydney, away from her family, away from adventure and away from freedom must have been extraordinarily difficult and in any circumstances. But to do that, I mean, I um. I think her tips for, for the ways that she survived, her coping mechanisms are, and you and I are both wearing red lipstick in honor of, uh, <laughs> right. in honor of one of her tips. But um, what are some of your favorite tips that she said for captivity, for making the um, best of solitary and, well, and uh, confinement? Yeah, the easiest way to get to the tips, and they're only about a, a minute or two long each, is um, on my, face, my um, website is katherinesmithwords.com, K-A-T-H-R-Y-N, smithwords.com. It's, it's, there's embedded, the link's embedded on the, um, the homepage. Um, she had things like she, she read, um, she taught English as a second language to some of her co-prisoners and um, used a book called Three Men in a Boat, which is such a hilarious book. So I said, you know, read something funny. She learned a new skill. She learned to darn socks. Now, this is a lady who had had a maid who did all her sewing for her all her life, and she got this big pile of socks and darn socks. Um, she in enjoyed the opportunities to hear great music. Um, she would listen to the Berlin Symphony, and that was a, kind of an escape for her. Um, one night she got all the French generals playing this game where she lay down on her back with a glass of water on her forehead and was able to get to her feet without dropping the glass or using her hands to push up from the floor. She was 42 years old. So then all the generals tried to do it and they were just getting doused right and left. And uh, so, you know, she kind of had a, a life of the party kind of thing that she it. But one of the things she found really thrilling is she was there watching the Battle for the Rhine um, and, and had, had all these artillery officers around her telling her everything about the guns and the, you know, the, how big they were. And she said it was just the most thrilling night of her life to watch that. And they were watching it from the, the suite at the hotel where Chamberlain had stayed when he'd come to meet with, with Hitler prior to the Munich Accords. So... Uh, it was, I think it was an adventure that she had not planned to go on, but um, her secretary, Doris Walters, said that, <laughs> that she uh, said that anytime things did not go as she planned, it was just an opportunity for a different kind of adventure. So I guess that's what she had. She definitely had a different one, different mm -hmm. one with that. Anyway, I, I, I really enjoyed um, the survival techniques that um, she and her fellow um, inmates yeah. Came, and captives came came up with and for coping mechanisms. I think they're quite quite wonderful. Um, how do you think that the um, that the war changed her? Her life had been relatively. She'd been seeking adventure and seeking danger and seeking um, trouble in a way, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and thrills before, yeah. and then this actually being that close to close yeah. to. Yeah. Um, death it and was, to lack of freedom how how do you it, think it affected it her it was very eye-opening for her i mean she had she had uh, trips on trains and cars where they were going through fighting she was watching bond she was going through bond as it was being firebombed and people were running through the streets screaming um she was on a car going through a refugee um you know big groups of refugees beating on the car windows begging for help 
So when she got back, um, she and Sydney and a friend of them started a relief organization called the Medley Plan, where they paired up cities. Um, Charleston was a, a partner with, uh, I think, uh, Fleurus, France, um, and, and gathered supplies and money and food and things like that for people um, all over Europe. She also became much more philanthropic, and, um, and it was after the war that she stopped hunting uh, big game. She always enjoyed bird hunting, but I think she had just kind of seen enough shooting by that point and uh, was ready to do something else. So it had a long, a very big impact on her. Where did she return after the war? Did she return to New York? Came back, or did... came, she came back to New York eventually. She um, met up with Sydney there. She got to go to Hawaii with him for about six months while he was being thrown out of the service. And then they came back to Medway and they went on some more expeditions together, um, went to India and um, together well, with Smithsonian, I think. And uh, she continued to do the expeditions, but always as a, um, in a scientific and, and not primarily as a hunter that, that was involved in capturing game. She so, also so had a, a short and unhappy second marriage. And yes, then after so, that, she took her name, her old married name back. To me, again, back to the, the romance part of this, um, um, just briefly without going too much into it, but it is it was it was heartbreaking for her and it was heartbreaking to read yeah. um, when Sydney passed away. What what age was he when what? what I just like to say that he predeceased her. Um, yeah. I mean, Gertie lived to be almost a hundred, and it, it was a really heartbreaking thing. Um, yeah. She doesn't say much about it, and sometimes by saying little, she just says, um, "I didn't do much of anything for a year." Okay. And for someone like Gertie to say that. Um, but she tried to make, keep Medway the way Sydney wanted it, you know, followed out, carried out the plans he had. And um, I just, uh, some of the things people, family and friends told me about um, how she, things that she did that just made it known that Sydney was just the one man in her heart always. And they're buried together at Medway. Well, I know that there are um, probably a lot of people um, in the Charleston audience and beyond, um, if they're watching in real time or maybe later when this is recorded, who've had um, who had the pleasure of going to Medway, and um, I'm sure she was not entertaining in the same way that she might have at one point, but she still continued to love to have people around her and to share um, to share that space, the log cabin, and. Mm -hmm. and uh, Mm -hmm. Lots of exciting things. And I got to know her a little bit through some conservation work. And would you share a little bit with people? She did, yeah. she was involved with the Ace Basin and CAUSE and um, the Coastal Conservation League. Yeah, yeah. The, extraordinary, um, the Coastal extraordinary Conservation work. League was started by Dana Beach um, right about the time Hurricane Hugo came through and just, you know, snapped down every pine tree um, all up and down the coast. And Gertie had already decided to deed Medway to the Audubon Society when that happened, but the Audubon Society needed income to maintain it, and they were counting on that income from her timber, and timber was gone. So she um, just decided to replant trees for the next generation, and now they're being harvested selectively today, but she um, gave the, she put the property in a, a conservation easement, so whoever owns it has to, is bound to not develop it. And the house is in a conservation easement um, looked over by the Historic Charleston Foundation. Am I saying that right? Yeah, Historic Charleston Foundation has an easement on the house. On the house and some of the immediate grounds, about 80 acres mm -hmm. around it. And then the rest, 7,000 acres, is looked is after um, by Ducks Unlimited to be preserved as habitat. So no, um, it, it is in private hands. Now it's been sold and the new owner is following that those yeah. guidelines, yeah. So. Yeah, I know it really is quite an extraordinary part of her legacy, but also that that conservation easements, um, which now we those kind of roll off our tongue like it mm -hmm. is something um, quite normal. But you know, decades ago when she it was one of the very yeah. first who yeah. was willing to do this, and and it was um, an extraordinary leap the, to yeah. to take the value of the property and be willing to. Um, exchange the right for development or subdivision right. into, um, for in perpetuity that these are able to be protected and it really is she was a um, she was adventurous in that way that she was willing to to do that before others 
she worked very closely with um, Coy Johnston the second mm -hmm. in, um, in that area. And uh, he and Dana Beach both just have a lot of, just really sing her praises for what she did because not only did she put her own property um, in easement, she con you know, convinced other big landowners to do the same or to find some way to preserve the land. So over a million acres has been, put, has been protected since that time, including the Ace Basin and uh, Medway and lots and lots of other property. So that's a, a tremendous legacy, I think, for, for Derby. No, I I think that it is. It had a, it has it had and still has a ripple effect where mm -hmm. others were willing to do that. And I I really do believe that was one of her lasting legacies. That one that I know that her grandchildren and great grandchildren that are um are are um in the area and beyond are very proud of. I know it's um it, it's important. It's important, and we're all grateful for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I um I'm we're gonna have a few questions. I think they're going to, I think there've been lots of questions that have come in, but before I wanted to, before we move on to more questions about Gertie, um, which I'm sure people have, I, I was hoping that you would tell us a little bit about what you are writing um, now and what you're working on, and then we'll go back to Gertie in the question and answer. Well, thank you. I'm going off in sort of a different direction this time. Um, I'm writing a book um, about prohibition in the South, which means I can do lots of research in bar rooms, which is really fun. Um, but it's going to be a very different <laughs> book. It's going to be a history book. It's going to be sort of um, a travelogue. Um, I'm going to give you cocktail recipes and how you can take your own prohibition expedition and visit everything from the graves of bootleggers to modern day speakeasies to um, history museums and, and you know see what it was kind of like. But as everyone knows, prohibition was just a huge failure in this country, mostly because um, the law was ignored. But the South had gone dry way before the rest of the country. And every mistake the rest of the country made, we had already made and continued to make. So Charleston was a very, very, very wet city. And so were most of the coastal cities and they were moonshining in the mountains and rum running off the coast. It's, it was a really wild time. So the book's called um, Baptist and Bootleggers because those were the two uh, opposing forces that also worked together because they both wanted to get rid of legal alcohol, but for different reasons. Think about it. No. <laughs> well, that sounds fascinating. We look forward to it. And um, and I know that um, I would like, when this is over, I, if I had um, been better prepared, I would have, have had a cocktail um, that Gertie would have enjoyed um, <laughs> while, while we were having our talk. Um, I think I'll have one afterwards. Yeah, but I'm um, headed to the gin joint from here myself. So. Oh, good. <laughs> that sounds perfect. Um, so thank you, Catherine, and thank, oh, thank you for you. Um, all of your extensive research to write this book. Um, I'm again, it, it won the Benjamin Franklin Award um, from the Independent Book Publishers Association and um, for biography. It's really quite a wonderful um, read and I, it's, it's really perfect for this time of quarantine and for staying home or going out. Um, Gertie. Uh, the Fabulous Life of Gertrude Sanford Legendre, heiress, explorer, socialite, and spy. And um, it's an international story. It's a Charleston story. And thank you for writing it, Catherine. And I hope we have so many friends in the audience. I'm hoping that we will have Dutch is going to ask a few questions. Okay. And uh, and I, I bet there's some from people who um, have some connections with Gertie. It's always, it's always fun to meet someone who knew Gertie because I've, I've heard so many more hilarious stories about her. Uh, all, many of them involving snakes, but um, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, Dutch, thank you. <laughs> well, Catherine, I just, I just want to thank you because um, that was that was a great interview and Polly as well. That was that was wonderful. And just yeah, you glow when you speak. Good a, questioner. <laughs> you, you, you speak about something, someone you love, and something you love, and you can tell that you really threw yourself into uh, Gertie's world and the research. And that, so that's something that um, I got a few questions from the audience um, about. They're interested in how you found the story of Gertie, how you came across oh, her, okay. what inspired you to, to start yeah. that research. And well, it's kind of interesting. I've got a, uh, the, the person I dedicated the book to is a woman named Linda Harrell, a good close friend of mine, who um, is one of these people who just gets interested in the topic and tries to learn everything she can about it, whether it's Southern plantations or Chinese foot binding practices or whatever. And 
she had found um, Medway while surfing the internet, just looking up stuff about South Carolina plantations. And she started telling me about Gertie and, you know, outlining her life. And when she got to the part about her being captured by the Nazis and escaping over the Swiss border at the end of the war, I said, wait, wait, we're still talking about the same <laughs> woman who did all this? And she said, yes. And she was only 43 years old. By then she lived to be almost 100. So that was... Um, I knew immediately that it was going to be the next book I wrote. She had, she had, it seems like she had a lot of good taglines. If she was a movie, you could have oh, had, you could have had so many different uh, options. Yeah, of, she the had one to do a multi-part series. She couldn't, you couldn't do this in one movie. <laughs> well, I, I think that's a great idea. Can I interject though? Yeah. Was it there, to Catherine, um, tell quickly, there was a movie, wasn't there? That Kath, well, it wasn't exactly about her, but the character was based. Yes, it's, um, and that was written. It's, it's the movie Holiday with Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant and the Katherine Hepburn character is based on Gertie. But it came out in the 30s, and um, the man who wrote it, Philip Barry, was a Broadway play originally. He also wrote the Philadelphia story. And it was based on her and her siblings. And, um, and the Katherine Hepburn character is just, a, just an adventurous sort of um, nonconformist, just like Gertie. It's a great movie, very, very funny. What was the, the title of that movie again? Holiday. Holiday. Okay. Holiday. Well, yeah. how about this? If you were to, um, if you had your tr your your choice, and there was uh -huh. a, a, a new movie made about it, who would you cast to play? Uh, oh, you know, I just, oh, I don't know. I'm really bad on um, on who the new actresses are because almost everything I watch is on TCM, and so all these people are dead now. So if if, <laughs> if Hepburn was able to, yeah, to she, you know, we could we, we could um, bring her back to life and clone her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Catherine she, Hepburn. Even the accent probably would have been right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what What do you say Gertie's greatest achievement was, and what was her greatest weakness? Um, well, I think her greatest achievement was, was what she did for scientific research mm -hmm. and with conservation. Her greatest failure was with her children. She just, she was not a good mother. Or as she said, how could I have been a bad mother? I was never there. But she was not a motherly person, and she pretty much outsourced the raising of her children to others. And they resented her for it. For it. Um, Sydney was not a good father either, so... We we do have a question about um, someone that they were they were curious about where the the ch her children were during all her adventures mm -hmm. uh, and her traveling and did they ever go with her? Um, um, sometimes they would take them. She would take them to Europe and that kind of thing, but never on her expeditions. And she mm -hmm. would be, they'd be gone six, seven, eight months at a time. So they would leave them with um, nannies and governesses, and then they were sent to boarding school. Um, at some point, so um, you know, it was it was kind of it was a sad childhood for them. Hmm. Um, one of our friends, Sandra, has a question. Does, does she know Bell? Uh, and correct me if I say this wrong, but Bell Barack. Bell, Bell Brook. Um, and I, I write about that because they were contemporaries. I found no evidence that they knew each other, but they were very much of a kind. Bell Brook's um, property, Hopcaw Barony, in Georgia, near Georgetown, she was also put into a private foundation. And Bell Brook was able to leave the funds behind to manage the grounds, which Gertie did not. So, um, but they were very much alike in their adventurousness. Uh, Belle Baruch was the daughter of Bernard Baruch, the advisor to six presidents, and um, Hopkow Barony had been his hunting um, cons cons uh, preserve. And Belle loved loved it, uh, great naturalist like, like Gertie. But now I don't think they knew each other, and I think that may have been just due to the anti-Semitism within her social class. Yeah. So the Baruchs were Jewish. Um, now, so, you, you talk about her that she um, she was a, she acknowledged her b behavior to change that she had to a lot of her that was if we're talking about her hunting it went from uh, a pleasure to kind of um, there's purpose uh, mm -hmm. so there there is she did acknowledge that a lot of her what she was capable of do of doing um, and had the privilege to do um, was something that she wanted to to finish and make sure that in the end there was a purpose behind it. Um, it do you think if, if she was alive today and um, with 
current political and, and social climates, do you think she, what would her, what would her what opinion her be? be? Yeah, what would her cause be? I think conservation would still be her cause. Mm -hmm. um, Gertie was also a great lover of, the, of music and the art. She was an amateur painter. Um, she supported the symphony. Um, she led the mounting of a production of Corgi and Bass in Charleston. So I think the arts, um, historic preservation, but especially conservation, I think that would, if she had been given 20 more years of health, I think that would have been yeah. If she was given 20 more years to live, do you think she would have took it? If she could have been healthy, um, and she was in good health until about the last three years of her life. And when I look at pictures of her as a very old woman in a wheelchair, and mm -hmm. it's it's pretty sad to think about someone that vital that it's going to happen to all of us. But you know, she went to Morocco uh, for her birthday when I think she was ninety-six. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad at all. <laughs> I'll take <laughs> Uh, so one last question before you, uh, before we wrap up, um, and it's my own question that I'm, I'm interested to know. If you had one day with Gertie, what, what would you do? You could go anywhere in the world. You can do anything. Um, if you can go back in time, what, what do you, what go do you back do? in time, anything it, it, it's, it could be current day. It could be whatever you want. What, what are you going to do? I, I would be at the, I would be at the Ritz, Ritz bar with her. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'll join yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, drinking drinking martinis and just hearing her fool around and talk and, and flirt with the bartender and, and just tell <laughs> stories. Yeah, yeah, that would be that would be so cool. <laughs> I think we can. I think we can all drink to that. And yeah, we'll <laughs> meet you at the Ritz once they lift the quarantine and the travel restrictions. <laughs> Let's meet at the Ritz for a martini and and drink. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I just Thank want. You. Thank you all again, um, and Catherine, especially you. This is, like I said, you, you can really so you can see fun. your passion. Um, and I implore everybody to purchase, repurchase. Um, if, yep. if you have a copy of the book, buy another one and give it to someone. Um, we need to Great support. Father's Day gifts. Exactly, yes. <laughs> um, get, get, make it a Father's Day gift that you can give to your mom. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or a college graduate. I mean, what an inspiration for someone not quite sure what they want to do with their lives. Exactly, and, yeah. And that was Gertie's whole thing was always say yes. I mean, she was talking about saying yes before it became a catchphrase like it is today. When the opportunity comes along, say yes. That's awesome. Oh, well, I'd, I'd say yes to that too. And I, I do want to say something that I didn't uh, say a little bit earlier, but I always get on my soapbox when we're um, gathering in person or online to remind everyone um, that, that these conversations are so unique and so special. And uh, to have this collaboration with the Charleston Library Society and with Evening Post Books, our local independent publisher, and Buxton Books, uh, your independent bookstore at 160 King Street. It's really, it's really something that's unique and special to Charleston, and we're just so honored to get to be a part of it, uh, to get to share these conversations with authors, award-winning authors like Catherine Smith and um, fascinating topics. And this is a series, it's an ongoing series. You do not have to be a member of the Library Society to attend. We encourage you to do so because it's an extraordinary, um, institution and it is the living room of Charleston as Anne said um, at the last at the last uh, conversation and so we invite you back invite your friends to come you do have to RSVP so you need to invite them so they can RSVP we want to make sure that these are um, that they go well and that helps Dutch do that very very well and uh, but join the Library Society uh, support uh, Evening Post Industries um, we really do need independent journalism now more than ever. Uh, buy a book uh, from an independent bookseller, um, any independent bookseller, um, but I especially recommend Buxton Books. <laughs> uh, give us a call and uh, we deliver, we do curbside pickup. And if you're in these times of COVID willing to wear a, a face covering and some hand sanitizer, you can come in and browse in the bookstore where we have conversations every day. So thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Dutch. Thank you, Michael. And thank you to all of you who took some time out this afternoon to um, join us for conversation. We look forward to seeing you next time. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Have a Bye. wonderful night. <laughs> Bye.